if you ate today, thank a farmer. And I think if you don't understand the cost of these machines that are behind you here, these tractors, the cost to operate farms, you can't keep whittling away at their profit margins. You're just going to put them out of business, and we all depend on them. If there's no farm, there's no economy. So I, that's what I have to say for the people who live in the big cities that don't understand or don't own property, don't understand what this is all about. It's about small rural business, rural communities, the way we've lived for years, our church socials, our community halls, all of that is being threatened. We need help. If, if we're going to be over-regulated, uh, the government has to come forward with some money. They need money for to help us upgrade our water systems, uh, nutrient management, uh, small abattoirs. And it, it just can't be done. If, if they're going to bring all these new regulations in, farming cannot pay for all that regulation. We cannot pay for it. We're in depression prices as far as the cattle are going, but unfortunately nothing else is in depression prices. You know, the cost of fuel goes up, the cost of hydro goes up, everything else that crosses the desk as far as bills have probably gone up in the last year or at least have stayed the same, certainly have not gone down, but yet your income has been reduced to basically zero. We run about three, four hundred acres. I have 150 head of cattle, haven't sold any for two years. And I'm tired. And I'm 73 years old, my husband's 82, and we have no help. There's um, beef that's still being imported into Canada, where yet uh, Canadian producers aren't being looked after first, where that's where I think the priority needs to be, is to look after your own country and your own people first. And that's, I think, where the government has gone astray right now. The Ministry of Environment figures sawdust is a danger to us and we have to close up sawmills because of sawdust and bark piles. Well in Lanark we've told them we're not going to let them close down anymore. In the last year they've closed down eight small family sawmills, thrown about a hundred people out of work and we've said we're not going to let them close down any more mills in Lanark and Renfrew and the MOE is going to get the message clearly. The fight we're involved in now is a lot more than just sawdust, nutrient management, and chlorinated water. It's about having the freedom to make a living off your property, having the freedom to enjoy your property and the fruits of your labor, and not have to worry about our government arriving and putting you out of business. It's not every day that you can join an organization that is dedicated to a cause and has leaders that have the foresight to realize we must stick together as a large amalgamated group. All for one and one for all. People, we want true justice and freedom and a whole lot less government control. Long live the Lanark landowners and other likewise groups. Thank you. My story does not begin here. It begins years earlier. My ancestors, the McCaffreys, Healy's, Blacks, and Keys, left Ireland around 1845 during the Potato Famine. They came to Canada to begin a new life, one that offered hope for a bright new future. It was a struggle for them to survive, but they did. They cleared the land and built their barns and houses with the logs off their property. They dug wells for their water and milked their cows. As well, they raised chickens, pigs, sheep, and cattle. 
They grew their own food from their garden and milled the wheat for flour to make bread. Every spring, summer, and fall, they plowed, planted, and harvested their crops. Farming evolved over the years, and each generation enjoyed the benefits of more modern machinery. My siblings and I are the sixth generation to live on this property. My dad, who was raised on his parents' dairy farm, married my mom, a girl from the city. He brought her out to his grandparents' century-old farmhouse to begin their married life. His love for the land and his desire to continue farming was the only reason that I grew up on a beef farm. There was always work to be done on our farm, and we were expected to contribute in whatever way we could. After the work was done, we always found time for fun. We spent many hours exploring trails throughout our bush lot and building forts, rafts, and houses for our pets, as well as skating on our pond, making slides, and snowmobiling around the fields. There was no shortage of machines to drive around in. As a farm family, our time is very devoted to feeding and caring for our animals and the many related jobs that are a part of farm life. Helping our dad build or fix fences, load wood, unload hay, work in the garden or help fix broken machinery were all part of our chores. In the summer, many of our hot days were spent cultivating the fields, building loads of hay and drawing in corn wagons. Although there was lots of work to be done, I wouldn't have traded my lifestyle for any other. However, it wasn't until I was older before I truly appreciated how lucky I was to live in the country. I spent four years living in downtown Kingston, studying film at Queen's University. Although it was a great experience, I feel it gave me a balance and a better understanding of the two different ways of life. On May 20th, 2003, I was out on the town celebrating my 21st birthday unaware that the Canadian agricultural industry was crashing down, reeling from the news that BSE had been found in an Alberta cow, and that the borders to the United States were closed to our cattle and sheep. I had no idea that night that this news would create a string of events that I would soon be caught up in. Upon graduation, I decided for two good reasons to come home. I missed the farm, and I had no money. I knew that the borders to the states had been closed, but I didn't see firsthand the impact of this until I was back, living in the farm community. I was intrigued by the individual stories that I was hearing from my friends and neighbors, but I still wasn't sure how it impacted me or my family. I found out soon enough. By chance one day I was sick and stayed home from my summer job. My dad said he was going to a farm auction with my brother Jesse. A farmer had gone bankrupt. His whole income was based solely on the export of dairy cattle to the United States. I felt compelled to go with them, and being a film studies graduate, I picked up my video camera to record this event. It wasn't until I saw the images through the lens of my camera that I truly realized the scope of this crisis, and how it was hitting home closer than I wanted. Items that the farmer had gathered over a lifetime were gone with the wave of a hand or a nod of a head. It was obvious to me by the strained faces of the people in the crowd that rural Ontario was hurting. Many seemed to fear that they could be next. It was this event that sparked my interest and eventually my decision to make this documentary. I started poring over the scrapbooks full of articles that my parents had been saving for the past two years. I soon realized that it wasn't just the farming industry that was in trouble. All sorts of small rural businesses seemed to be fighting a growing battle with their governments at all three levels. I read stories of good, hard-working, honest citizens being devastated by visits from their government officials. The Ministry of Environment, the Ministry of Natural Resources, the Department of Fisheries and Oceans, and local health units seemed to be attacking the safe and accepted practices that had been used by these businesses for years. I read about sawmills being shut down because of sawdust and campgrounds having their previously safe water testing system questioned. 
Farmers selling their produce at their local farmers markets were harassed by health inspectors. The list went on and on. I was shocked. There were so many rural issues and concerns that I knew I could not possibly give each topic the justice it deserved. The feelings expressed in this film are mine and my family's. Over the last year and a half of making this documentary, I've had my low points and my high points as I questioned whether it would be of any help. The issues seemed so big and so many that I wondered if they could be fixed. As the story grew, it became obvious that one person can make a difference, and a lot of people can make an even bigger difference. A lot of the demonstrations, food strikes, and tractor rallies have been organized by the Lanark Landowners Association, or the LLA, a group that was started around a kitchen table by four friends. Injustices against honest rural citizens was happening too frequently, and laws were being passed and implemented that did not seem to address real problems or use common sense. Randy Hillier, an electrician by trade and rural resident, was disgusted by the treatment his friends were receiving at the hands of their local government officials. Brian Hanna, John Vanishbank, and Merle Bowes made up the remaining founding members. A vote was taken and Randy was declared the president of the LLA. This group started off small, but with conviction. When they said they were going to do something, they did it. It wasn't long before politicians, bureaucrats, and the media recognize and acknowledge the existence of this growing group. The rural revolution of 2003 was fully on its way. Let them try. Let them try. What the thing is, if they want to put all of us in jail, I'd like to see them try. Where's this passion coming from? <laughs> Over the next few hours, I will be taking you behind the scenes and behind the headlines of the LLA and introduce you to the people that they are fighting for.